again this morning, that or 39, excuse me, that um, we were going to have Dr. Lorraine Hale, past president of Presentation College in South Dakota, a very small but powerful little state, um, come and speak with us about things that she sees. And, and it's very interesting because the image that uh, uh, Dr. Hale put in her uh, introduction to all of you was using 3D glasses and how we look at things. And of course, that meshes right away with our learning how to look introduction <laughs> that we do in the very beginning of the semester. This is a social justice presentation. It is a significant part of every single residency. One of the ways we were approved for this program is that social justice is a piece of the uh, program. The delivery is something that we measure and that we show we can hear the justice issues of many groups, not just the group that we happen to advocate for. And of course, everyone who goes to the Union Institute is advocating for something. That's sort of what we do. But um, today, we have a very special presentation. I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Hale. As I said, past president of the university. She's been extraordinary in bringing education and dealing with justice issues to Native Americans across the state. She's published a very fine text that serves as a reference book for Native Americans. And um, I'm very proud to call her my colleague and my friend and my buddy and a great advocate for many of you in this program. So I'm going to ask Dr. Butel to go through the little uh, nuances of what we're doing today and why lovely faculty had pictures on and we sort of cut off your heads so that we could just focus on Dr. Hale and the fact that you listen to all that she says. And Dr. Butel will explain that you will hold questions, although you will put them in the chat box. Constance? All right. Well, uh, every phone has been muted except uh, for uh, Dr. Hale, myself, and Dr. Sachs. I'm going to help facilitate the process. And what you're going to be doing is I'll clear the chat in a moment. And um, as you have questions uh, developing as Dr. Hale is speaking, Go ahead and put them down. And then um, at the end of her uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Hale can scroll back and go through them. Or I can help facilitate. Uh, Dr. Hale, you just let me know how you want to handle it. So um, please uh, let us know. Well, please hold your questions. Um, develop them as the presentation is being done. And they will be answered uh, at the end during the, the Q&A process. Um, and if, let's see, if anything else comes up, Dr. Hale, if you need anything, you just let me know how I can facilitate. And Dr. Sachs and I are going to disappear, and we will turn everything over to you, Dr. Hale. Thank you. I notice there's a little um, delay with my camera. Is, can I do anything about that? No, that's just the, the line speed. Oh, OK, fine. Um, well, thank you all very much uh, for the opportunity to speak with you today about social justice, particularly in relation to the, um, my understandings with regard to the Native Americans in South Dakota. I had hoped to have a colleague of mine with me. However, it's the inauguration of the new president of Presentation College and she has to be there. She is Native American and she runs our out outreach campus on um, Eagle Butte Reservation or the Lakota Reservation there. Uh, Dr. Thorstenson recently completed her doctorate and last weekend she was particularly excited as she received her Lakota name. And she wrote me an email during the week and said, I cannot express to you the great joy that I have in being uh, a recipient of my Lakota name. And I think just that even that little story begins to set a stage for how different the culture is of the Native Americans from the European culture. After Dr. Sachs asked me, would I talk to you about um, social justice and my experiences in South Dakota, 
I thought about it and it struck me very much that when we look at social justice and social justice is really, uh, or not really, one definition of it is justice uh, within a social group. And really it's justice within this particular case, the interactions of the social groups of Native Americans and of Europeans or the other Americans in South Dakota. And if you, it's like looking at a picture. It was to me anyway, to research this area and prepare the talk. When you go and stand before a picture in an art gallery, for example, if you're in the Louvre and you look at the picture of Liberty there, it's a two-dimensional picture uh, with some illusion of 3D. Uh, however, they're even standing looking at a picture, if you've got somebody with you who understands the picture and describes it to you, you see different aspects. You see different um, portions of the picture that strike you in a totally different way. For example, if you look at the uh, picture of liberty in the revolution, the French Revolution, you suddenly see the reds and how the reds play out and you see the whites and how the white colour plays out and you see the blue and how the blue colour plays out and you get begin to get uh, a notional or ideological or idea type depth to the picture. However, it's still a 2D picture when you uh, think in terms of how 3D works today. If you go to Disney World, Disneyland and go see the uh, Fantasia there and you put on the 3D pictures, you're sitting comfortably in your seat and the next minute you're ducking because the trombone is going to uh, hit you in the head or uh, Tinkerbell is out in the stage or bubbles are bursting all around you. Or if you're at the Rockettes at Christmas time and you're sitting on a, um, uh, a sleigh and suddenly you're winding through the canyons of New York City and it's a whole different experience. You get involved in the understanding of the picture and you're swaying this way and you're swaying that way and you're ducking this way and you're ducking that way. Well, I'd like to suggest that this presentation, we put on 3D glasses that we look at the Native American uh, situation or probably wrong, poor choice of word, but we look at the interactions between Europeans and Native Americans in the social justice perspective from a 3D aspect that we get real depth into the uh, picture uh, through our 3D glasses. And with the glasses, the framework of our glasses would be history, the uh, lenses of our glasses would be understanding what's happening in interaction between Native Americans and the uh, other groups of America and the sec third, a second lens would be what do we do about all of this, the so what of the whole uh, issue of social justice and Native Americans. And I'd like to suggest that we can use these glasses to uh, look at many situations uh, where we're challenged to look at the social justice of the situation. That it's, um, and particularly as doctoral students, and that you're going to be leaders in different areas of education or whatever your chosen profession is, you're being given skills that in a very particular way enable you to put on 3D glasses. Your dissertation, for example, when you do your lit review, in a way you're doing the historical perspective 
the framework of your glasses. And then you have to step back and look at how does the history that leads to this present situation interact to develop the picture of today? And then what are we all going to do about it? I've just recently come back from Australia and it, what fascinates me is how different the two cultures are and how alike the two cultures are. And I'm going to concentrate a little bit for a while on how alike the two cultures are. At the present moment in Australia, the government has uh, just announced that it is putting off the referendum that it's going to have on the constitution. The government wants the constitution changed so that the, um, the constitution reflects the place of the First Nation, that there is reference throughout the uh, constitutional statement about the First People of Australia. However, it believes that it has not done enough work. Uh, it has not educated the populace long enough uh, for the uh, referendum on constitutional change to pass. So it is going to uh, put in place instead a sunset clause. And this sunset clause will state when the, the referendum will take place. However, over the last couple of years, there have been public statements by government, local civic organisations and uh, different groups throughout the country of apology for what was done to the Aboriginal people by the first Europeans. And one of the interesting things I hear so often is, well, why should I apologise? I didn't do all of this. Uh, I've got friends who are Aboriginals and I um, respect them and um, we get along well together and I wouldn't do those things. You see, one of the things that many of the Europeans did when they first went to Australia was to organise uh, hunting trips on the weekends to hunt the Aboriginals because the Aboriginals used to uh, kill the sheep uh, for food. Uh, they were used to being a nomadic people who walked uh, different uh, territories of the country to gather, uh, hunt and gather their food. And so if the Aborigines were in, uh, not the Aborigines, I apologise, if the sheep were on their land, they killed them and they ate them. The um, Europeans, the British in particular, who were the main colonisers of Australia, took a very dim view of this. And so they used to organise hunting parties to uh, pay back and give retribution to the Aborigines. Well, we know that many sorts of situations similar to that happened here in America. And yes, we were not part of that. And no, we did not personally hunt Aborigines or the many other horrific things that were done to Native Americans and to Aborigines. However, in all realism, we are who we are because of our forebears. There is a line of continuity from our first peoples who came to America or to Australia and established the um, culture that we have here now. The culture that imposed itself uh, on the American society. We are in direct lineage with those people. It may be a relative lineage from very early times or it is a lineage that has come in more recent times and brought into the um, dominant culture, uh, the regular culture of America or in the Australia's case, the regular culture of Australia. So the culture in which we are in line is a different culture 
from the uh, Native American culture or the uh, First Peoples culture of the land. They were here first. They were in Australia first. They had established their way of doing things. However, during the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, peoples of Europe moved out from their lands into these distant lands of Hispaniola, of uh, America, the United States, Canada, Australia, Fiji, and so it goes on. And they brought a culture with them which by and large, if the heritage was mainly English, did not interact with the native culture. The French and the Spanish uh, much uh, more interacted with the native cultures and developed a Creole culture. But we're looking at uh, America here and we're looking at uh, the fact that we came in and this, we're looking at realities. This is not judgment day. It's not our job to judge um, how good, bad or indifferent the uh, first settlers to America were. They were people of their times they were there were many very bright people there were many people who uh, were selfish there were people who were generous they, they were in other words typical people of their times and limited human beings just as we are the pretty well typical people of our times and we have our limitations one thing that we have that they did not have is access to education and information. And we have the opportunity, particularly uh, in programs such as this, in this uh, uh, educational ed leadership uh, degree, to reflect, to develop a framework, to begin to look at what is it that uh, we brought, what is it that has impacted so much on the Native Americans and created the particular situations in which we live today. I have a couple of quotes that I would like to um, talk about. Uh, and this one's from Crazy Horse. And if you go to um, South Dakota now, uh, in the Black Hills region area, you will see a, a statue uh, being carved out of the hills. It's kind of a counterbalance to the uh, presidential uh, carvings and it is of Crazy Horse. And I don't know if you know the whole story of Crazy Horse, but it is a rather tragic story. But I'd like to just make a quote of his. We preferred hunting to a life of idleness on the reservation where we were driven against our will. We preferred our own way of living. All we wanted was peace and to be left alone. In South Dakota, there are six reservations. In the early days, there was just the uh, one large reservation, but as the uh, in a pastoralists and the uh, graziers and people and the government moved more and more west. They kept dividing and redividing the reservation so that now we have six. And I'm not sure if you know of the significance of the Black Hills. The Black Hills for the Native Americans, particularly those that live on Pine Ridge, is the center of their sacred uh, site. And in many ways, what we have done in the Black Hills would be similar to um, taking over the Cathedral of St. John the Divine here in New York, taking over Notre Dame in Paris, taking over Westminster Abbey and setting up our commercial enterprises, which is what we did. In fact, Custer was moving out of the Black Hills 
and they after his campaign there and uh, the Senate, the Congress of, of the time said that the Black Hills were to be given back to the Native Americans. And on his journey out, some of the soldiers found gold. So the result was that the Black Hills were re-seized from the Native Americans and the hills were mined for gold. A few years back, um, Congress ordered that reparation be made to the Native Americans in terms of billions of dollars, uh, which would represent the buying of the Black Hills and the interest from that money which should have been paid so many years ago. The response of the Native Americans on Pine Ridge was, we do not want your money, we want our sacred site back again and that still has not been um, resolved. Red Cloud wrote, in 1868, men came out and brought papers. We could not read them, and they did not tell us truly what was in them. When I reached Washington, the great father explained to me that the interpreters have deceived me, and all I want is right and justice. Red Cloud lived 1822 to 1909. And Luther Standing Bear has written this about um, the Native Americans and their approach to life. Out of the Indian approach to existence, there came a great freedom, an intense and absorbing love for nature, enriching faith in a supreme power, and principles of truth, honesty, generosity, equity, and brotherhood as a guide to mundane relations. Now, as we think about the actual situation now at this moment in um, South Dakota, we have six reservations. On these reservations, and let me tell you, they do not constitute the best land of South Dakota. The um, best land of South Dakota um, agriculturally is probably more around the Aberdeen area, which is 180 miles from where we had our campus. The reservation land in many areas is very poor pastoral land. During the winter months on the reservations, there's very little um, employment. In fact, unemployment on the reservation on which we worked can go up to 70%. There is no alcohol. There is alcohol and, and drugs are forbidden on the reservation. However, outside the Pine Ridge, uh, Ridge Reservation within uh, seeing distance, there are four um, liquor stores that have been put up by the white people to sell alcohol to uh, Native Americans specifically. The Native Americans have taken out a um, lawsuit to try and have these uh, alcohol uh, liquor stores moved, but um, there's a lot of toing and froing about that. Even though the reservations are sovereign states, they are bound by federal law, the Native Americans do pay taxes and they do not receive handouts from the federal government once a month or whatever. They receive the same kind of benefits uh, from the government that uh, any other person in South Dakota would receive. There's a lot of mis misconception uh, about Native Americans and welfare, uh, and I find exactly the same um, misconception in Australia. They say, well, look what we do for them, and they're so ungrateful. Um, they can't even keep their houses properly. 
in, in Australia, the uh, government in its infinite wisdom uh, went out and built all these houses on um, the uh, reservations for the Aborigines. They did not incorporate the Aborigines in the building of the houses at all. And they just built normal European houses. And they went back in a year or two. And a lot of the houses had been stripped and were being used as firewoods. And there was a lot of righteous in indignation about how ungrateful and um, how really, what can you do about these people? They, they just don't appreciate what we try to do for them and look what they've gone and done. Well, nobody bothered to ask the Aborigines, do they want to live in a house to begin with? And they don't. It's part of their culture and their being to want to be outside and look at the stars at night time. The climate is very different from South Dakota where they did build their teepees. However, if you go back in history, what happened was the Native Americans would follow the buffalo uh, or the bison from the northern plains down to the southern plains and they would travel behind them. And um, if you saw the movie Dancing with Wolves, you'd see how they'd get them over a cliff uh, so that they could get the meat and the fur and the skins that they needed for the winter months. But with the advent of the farmers and the graziers and the pastoralists, uh, fences were put up. So this moving backward and forward from high plains to low plains was not possible anymore. So we forced the uh, Native American into a different lifestyle and uh, we were forcing them to become farmers with no history of farming, with no history of our um, working and asking and sitting down in collaboration with to understand who we, with whom were we dealing and how do we move on from there. So again, we forced the Native American to our style of life. And what's more, we had such a low opinion of them that we would, uh, that we went out and we did exactly the same thing in Australia. None of this is said in judgment. It's all said in, this is a fact of history and how people thought of the, at those times and collected the young people, the children from the families and we took them to boarding school. And here in America, one of the big boarding schools was here on the East Coast, the Carlisle School, has quite a history. And for the Braves, we chopped off their plaits and we would not let them use their native language and we isolated them from their families so that they lived a Western style life. Just step back and try and imagine how traumatic this was for the family left behind, for the children brought to the boarding school. And then in the boarding school, we taught them Western ways, even though their life experience up to the time they were brought to the uh, boarding school was set out in a Native American way. And one of the things about Native Americans, which is so different from us, it's a whole family situation. The brothers and sisters of the um, husband and wife take different roles. So the aunts and uncles uh, interact differently with Native American children than they do with us. Uh, for example, the um, mother and father uh, look after the children and nurture the children. The aunts and the uncles are responsible for the disciplining of the children and the education of the children in so many ways. And that's a toing and froing, which still happens at the present time. So that uh, Native American children, when they're in their family situation, uh, will act differently from uh, what is typical, what we see as typical in an American situation. So 
there's a whole history, a whole long history of how things were done in one particular way, in a Native American way. And as you notice, Native Americans, whenever we see the paintings, the pictures, they have the discussions or whatever, sat in circles. And that emphasized all of the time the um, communality of the um, tribe and the tribal family. And they had their distinct roles, just as we had our distinct roles of um, the, what the men did, what the women did, and what the children did. There were the similar distinct roles in the Native American um, tribe, but they were almost opposite of everything that we did. Uh, their teepees, for example, were round so that the evil spirits couldn't gather in the corners. And what do we do? We put them in houses which are square. We go for efficiency and effectiveness. They go for communality and let's talk it through, which from a Western point of view is very, uh, and many times is very inefficient. It's like, let's have someone responsible and um, make the decision and let's direct it forward and move on. The other is let's sit down, let's uh, work it out and that can take days of uh, work. So you've got this um, situation um, where you have what we saw, see as justice in the um, uh, American society at large and what would be justice or social justice for the Native American family at large and they're coming from two different uh, backgrounds. And as we're the dominant culture so often, where we require the Aborigines in Australia, the Native Americans in, uh, in America to come most of the way towards us. And then I would ask, is that truly social justice? I think, uh, we, and I'm not saying for one minute that we've got to go back to 1492 or uh, 1776 or any of this kind of thing at all. But I am saying is that we need to get the framework, the history, the understanding so that we can look at the situation. We have more opportunities. Now, they are getting the opportunities um, that are just part and parcel of our lives. Um, the, the, on most of the reservations, there are uh, post-secondary institutions. Now, that uh, we've been out on the reservation, and I'll talk about presentation's response to um, being on the reservation and what we've had to learn over the years that we've been there. We've been out there about 33 years, and uh, which is quite a long time for a non-Native American uh, college. And Julie, whom I had hoped to have with you today, runs the uh, campus for us out there. And it is a full campus. Uh, in the services that it offers, but it's on a small scale. We have between 50 and 70 students, and that's all that we've had um, most of the time that we've been at Eagle Butte. We came to Eagle Butte as a, a result of the tribal elders inviting Presentation College from Aberdeen, South Dakota, to come to Eagle Butte, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about 180 miles away, to establish a nursing school. They understood that they needed to educate the um, um, young men and women on the reservation to be able to nurse the um, populace there. People do not want to go and live in Aberdeen. Uh, it's very hard to get uh, people to move from other parts of America to live in Aberdeen, which has 25,000 people how much more difficult to get them to move out to Eagle Butte, 180 miles from Aberdeen. Um, there are a couple of towns in between. Some towns in South Dakota are 300 people. 
the whole reservation, um, I think, is about eight and a half to 10,000 people. Whole Eagle Butte, Reserva uh, the Lakota Reser Cheyenne River Lakota Reservation. And these people, uh, the Native Americans and the other uh, people of the reservation, are spread out over this uh, fairly large area with a con small concentration in Eagle Butte itself. So you're really asking uh, a lot of that. You would be asking na uh, nurses to go out into the middle of virtually nowhere, where there are. When I first went to Eagle Butte. I would say most of the dwellings there were um, mobile homes. Over the uh, 18 years that I was, have, was associated with Eagle Butte, there's been a gradual improvement in the um, quality of the homes that have been built there, in the services that are being offered within Eagle Butte and, in, and the uh, advent of internet uh, has greatly improved communications. But there are parts of the reservation where you get no telephone service, where you don't have an electrical service, where you don't always have a full plumbing service. That That is their reality. And so they, under, they understand that they need to do a lot of um, their own education. And you can say, well, why don't they send the students off to uh, the local universities and colleges? Well, remember I talked about the family situation, that it's not just mum and dad, it's uncles and aunts and uh, cousins who form this family and a tight family it is. You, they're used to working their problems out in that larger communal group. You take a, a student and send him or her off the reservation into a regular uh, university or college and suddenly they're on their own. They have not watched their mothers and fathers sit down and balance a checkbook or do budgeting or a whole um, sort of um, individual un or small unit uh, type approach to life which is required of us who uh, go ma mainstream Amer America. They're used to a more communal approach. Uh, and it's still that way on the reservation that you take, uh, if, you're, if you want to have a meeting, the best way to have a meeting and get people there is to make it open uh, to more than just the students. And they can bring uh, the other family members along and make it a true celebration and have a meal. Different way of uh, acting. So they come in to the uh, local colleges and universities and after bit, about six weeks, they've gone back to the reservation. Um, a lot of that was we didn't understand fully how the family unit worked. We did not understand the supports that other people gave them. And suddenly we're asking them to put on a whole new understanding, new way of acting, and um, be successful academically. And I, I would suggest that we were not being just to the students um, so that the uh, tribal elders understood that we needed to come to the reservation and establish uh, a school there, which we did. And uh, for a long time, the only program that we offered was um, nursing. I was just distracted because I was thinking about the first pinning ceremony that I went to at uh, Eagle Butte. And it, it um, it was both a, a, a wonderful experience and a sad experience. It was wonderful to watch so many of the um, Native American students who did all of the studies and who uh, passed their RN exams, the same exams that everybody else did. 
and who were there supported by their husbands and their children and their families. And it was a sad experience, one, because I believe we failed. And I think we failed on a couple of levels. And one of the levels that I think we most failed on was we did not bring in enough of the Lakota culture and understanding into the nursing experience. We required that they do pretty much a Western nursing program in a Native American setting. And I do think that there could be a great improvement by bringing more of Native American elements into the nursing program. I'm not suggesting that we set up a Native American nursing program per se, because most of the medicine they're going to experience is Western medicine. However, if you uh, think about the last days of uh, Native Americans and their approach to spirituality and their approach to the afterlife, we do need to have a lot of uh, the medicine man or a lot of the elders involved in that sort of uh, experience both for the nurses so they understand which a lot of them would but the younger ones may not and uh, so that the hospital uh, also can make the accommodations for the um, patients. The other thing that I've, I found when we first went there was we felt we were taking something to the Native Americans and I don't think that's a socially just approach. I think in a response to the situation would be that we are mutually interacting to bring the, the benefits that Western society have. And let me be very clear, I'm not denigrating Western society. The efficiency, our attention to the scientific method, our attention to detail, our technology, our capitalism have all driven Western society to the great level of development that it has achieved. However, I would certainly ask the question, has that achievement been at a certain sacrifice? A sacrifice of um, the principles of truth honesty, generosity, equity, and community. The principles which I think are still more prominent in the Native American society. And if we take a, um, a so what approach to everything that has happened um, over the years, and we put on 3D glasses. The so what approach to me in this situation on the reservation is, what can we learn? What do we take away? What is the take away story for, for this, for the Western, for us, for the college as a whole, or whatever situation it is, that we, in which we find ourselves where there is some so level of social injustice. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is uh, kind of, um, we probably have a few more minutes here for, I don't want to throw out a whole lot more information there. Um, um, what uh, I'd like, I'm sorry, I distracted myself. I'd like to begin to summarize this and get it into a format that we're able to take some of the Native American experience and the college's experience and use the format to apply it to other situations. What, uh, so uh, in summary then, we're looking at what is just in a particular social situation in a social group and that social group can be any grouping it can be 
uh, groupings of ethnicity, it can be groupings of education, it can be um, different um, uh, health groupings, whatever. There are groupings. And we need to look at them and examine these groupings. See where did they come from? What has happened to them over, the, over time? And how are we as the dominant grouping? And that will not always be American society. That could be administration. It could be a different ethnic group. It could be a different uh, group in the healthcare situation. In other words, when we come to uh, situations where there's clashing or disagreement or um, rubbing or whatever, so different social groups, we need to look at the history. It, it didn't happen today. It's, it's got threads way back. Any social situation that you like to look at in a society has threads going back hundreds of years. You can see the beginnings of it. We need the historical framework. Then we have to look particularly at what is it in this situation that we are asking or why is there conflict between different social groupings? What do the social groups want? I haven't dwelt very much on what did the Europeans want from the Native Americans. Some of it, and I guess I didn't do that because some of it was so... It, we just seem to be surrounded by it, but perhaps it doesn't hurt. We wanted land. Uh, we wanted to divide the land as we wanted to divide the land. We wanted the Native Americans to fall into our way of life, to accept our laws, to accept the way we do things. We wanted um, to be the, um, the ones who... Um, set the pace. We did not appreciate that even though they may still have been arranged socially in tribal groups, the sophistication of their civilization or their culture. In other words, because we had the firepower, we believed we were better than. In Australia, because the English had the firepower, they could organise the raiding parties, they could go out at the weekend, they could shoot the Aborigines. So we didn't think about who was or who is this social group and who are we as a social group and how do we respect the other social group and um, how do we interact in such a way that we can move forward in, um, with justice for all. And, um, you know, justice is a very interesting concept. Uh, as when I was researching the term justice, uh, uh, one of the things, one of the definitions was it's the fundamental virtue of social institutions. Somebody else talked about justice as being harmony. And somewhere else, it's, uh, somebody else talked about you can't have peace without justice. And so there are many definitions of it, but it would seem to me that built into justice, I don't think it's just one thing. I think it's a very complex uh, virtue and it requires that we... Um, have understanding and that we are able to uh, look at situations, we can make judgments from situations, we can collaborate and we're going to have to make, uh, have compromises in uh, particular situations. And I will get, I notice I have a question up and I will get to that question in a few moments, but it, it fits in 
to uh, this, the question does, into this summary situation. So you as doctoral students, you're learning how to do real, uh, to do research, how to research your problem that you state, how research is built on the writings and the history of um, that other people have laid down in relation to your problem. You're going to ask questions about your problem, one of the lenses, asking about the present situation, uh, seeing that it's not a flat two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional, it's, and it's dynamic, and it's coming and it's going, it's present, it's past, it's future, it's all bound up there. And then the other lens, having gotten this kind of information, having the information dialogue uh, in the framework, you come out with your other lens and you look at um, results, things that we can do. And uh, I'd like to read something now from Black Elk. I think most of us have heard of Black Elk. Perhaps you have noticed that in the very lightest breeze, you can hear the voice of the cottonwood tree. This, we understand, is its prayer to the Great Spirit. For not only men, but all things and all beings pray to him continually in differing ways. So as I really wrap this up and made this concentration on the Native American situation, or not, not the American situation, but the, the, my experiences in many ways of Native Americans and even Australian uh, Aborigines. The thing that I'd have to say is, my, uh, from my experience with the Native Americans, is the peace. That generally, there's not the same frenetic pace of life that we tend to have as Westerners or um, people out of more European um, situation or larger American um, culture. But there is a, um, a greater at oneness with the land and uh, with the environment and with um, life then we t tend to uh, experience um, that they will take, they being the Native American, will take the time to sit down, to talk, to collaborate. And so their sense of time is very different from our sense of time, of our sense of urgency, of how we divide time up into hours and minutes and seconds and they don't do that in the same sort of way and it was I think in many ways this misunderstanding of how the Native American culture functioned that led a more organized utilitarian efficient uh, efficiency based culture to look at them in horror and say they don't get it they um, are not as advanced as we are. Therefore, we should take their children away. We should put them in our boarding schools. We should put them with European families so they can be more like us. Whereas I believe that it was a um, missing of the point of uh, who and what it is to be Native American. So in about three sentences, to sum up, framework is historical. Look into the culture, uh, look into the values that the group brings as one of the lenses. Look into what it is and who we are in the other lens and get them to come together to form a three-dimensional picture in which we interact. I will uh, leave my talk there. We're getting close to the hour of the talk, and I think that's enough of my voice. And I will go in and look at uh, a couple of questions that have come up. And I have one from Diane Vandermeer. I'll read the question. 
How can we bridge the gap of the two cultures in an attempt to bring Native Americans to a point of being able to access a sustainable economic base? And how can we begin to move the host culture to understanding that it is equal partnership relationship? Okay, I would reverse the uh, first question and say, how can we, we bridge the gap of the two cultures in an attempt to bring uh, for, um, Americans to a point of being able to access a sustainable economic base from the uh, Native American culture. The one thing, if you looked at um, the history of Native Americans and the history of Aboriginals, is that they, uh, the Aborigines, I've seen it written uh, in uh, a book that I was reading, were the perfect ecological human. Now the difference between um, Australian Aborigines, or one of the big differences in the Native Americans, is the fact Native Americans had the horse and the Australian Aborigine never had the horse. And if you start thinking about what that brings into a culture, having a horse and not having a horse, you can see how your um, the, the, the whole the two the cultures of the two uh, groupings are very different. And so uh, the Australians, Aborigines, had to be very careful of not fishing out or uh, gathering. They were hunter-gatherers, um, an area. They had, they, uh, but they didn't have huge areas. They did not go from the northern plains to the southern plains. They couldn't do that. That was too big a travel distance. So they had a smaller area. And they had to be very careful not to drive the animals away, not to eat all the uh, naturally growing fruit and vegetables and not to fish out an area. So they naturally developed a sustainability. Now, we on the other hand became uh, moved and became agrarian and then urban and then to be able to feed the increasing multitudes, we mechanized and became technical in our development of food. So food didn't hold us back. We, didn't, we don't interact with food. We don't have the same cultural heritage that the Native American has in relation to food and sustainability. So I think they can help us a lot to develop a sustainable economic base if we don't expect, and I think the writing is on the wall that we can't continue to expect to be able to use technology um, to be a uh, technology to increase um, food production that the Native Americans certainly have something to talk to us about with regard to sustainability and the world and the earth. And lucky for us, the uh, Native Americans are beginning to return to many of their uh, previous ways and previous understandings and previous um, cultural habits and and beliefs so that they really uh, do have an opportunity. Uh, and if, if we sit down and talk, um, and how can we uh, move the host, host culture to understand that it is an equal partnership in relationships? The only way that you can ever do that is to truly make them equal partners in, in relationships. And um, it, it's the same in any uh, situation where you had um, women who wanted to be equal partners with men, where you had um, the different um, societal groups of, and the struggle that we see going on at the moment, where you have uh, same sex um, uh, struggling for equal access that um, we develop for, for marriage and so on. You've got to have your legislation supporting it. So you've got to have a belief 
in the laws of your country that support that and recognize the equality. We have to believe that people are equal with us, though very different from us. And the challenge there is always, how do you enshrine the minority point of view so that it is truly respected? And we find that a difficult thing to do. So it's, it's all going to start with up here in our understandings, in the virtues and values that we accept from the other group and that we work with in the other group. So Diane, I hope that answers some of your question. Dee Harris, how do we show respect and empathy to those who are different, different from us? What does it entail to do justice in a way that the, the same as African American women's and are there other similarities between the cultures? All, the first fundamental similarity be all, behind all, among all cultures is the fact we are human beings. We are born, we grow up, we uh, love, we get distressed, we can be difficult, we feel pain and we die. That's fundamental. And if we understand that though people are different um, they are fundamentally very like us. It's how they express that and it's their understanding of that and it's the fact that they have a different world view. It's the same as have, having different faiths. Um, some faiths believe life finishes at uh, death. Others believe we're reincarnated. Others believe we go to heaven. Uh, others believe that uh, the Native Americans, that the, the spirits are there with them and they can see them and they interact with them. I apologize, sorry. Um, that we interact with them. In, in that way, respecting that just because it's not my way doesn't mean it's wrong. One of the things that we need to watch as a dominant culture or um, out of the European ways is we have the right way and therefore everybody else should be doing what we are doing. That there is one way and that is my way or the European way and that's what um, uh, when the English went into uh, into Australia, they didn't bother asking the Americans. They were, the Americans, the Aborigines, they were right. Therefore, you do it this way. And if we truly respect people, we will sit and we will listen to what is it they are true they are saying or want to say, and we will believe that they bring equality with them. Um, uh, where are we up to? That's he was what, the last I one. I think. Was, uh, is that uh, who? Oh, D. Right. Should and be what does? Uh, well, I'm up to uh, up to D. How do we show? Uh, uh, I'm still talking with you, Martha. I, uh, no, D. I think. No, wait there. Let me go back up a bit. I, I think I only got some of. With D. You just finished with D. Finish it all. Okay, Martha. I find it very interesting that, that natives involve other mothers in their culture and child rearing much the same as African American women. Are there other similarities between the two cultures? You know, um, I'd have to say, Martha, I don't know enough about, um, oh, thank you very much, um, uh, Constance. I don't know as much about um, the African American cultures in uh, Africa and how much of their culture they brought to America and how much of the culture was destroyed by um, their experiences as slaves here in America to be able to give a fair answer to that question. That would be something that I would need to research 
or on the flip side, perhaps you could research it and tell me, because I really, I, it's a great question. I'd love to know uh, much more about it than I do. So thank you for that um, question. It, it's now piqued my interest. Uh, Dr. Henderson, when I visited Chile in 1991, right after the Pinochet regime had been dismantled to a very large extent because of the outrage of the women and their campaign, and I dodged the word and made it English because I was far um, better with the English of justice and truth, I think I hear you saying that we need, as a matter of social justice, to practice justice and truth and mercy. Yes, you are getting my message. Um, see, we are the ones who play with the abstract ideas and we are the ones who develop the constructs of justice and truth and mercy and we are the ones who put them into books and we are the ones who take them to uh, university and we are the ones who have a social justice lecture. And so that's, I think, uh, what we, for us, we need to recognise that in a lot of the other cultures, many of these, uh, many of our words do not have a correlate. They don't abstract on those issues in the same sort of way that we do, but they practice it all of the time. Uh, that truth and justice and mercy is part of their way of life. And I think, um, you know, we run into enough uh, situations along the way when somebody from another culture will say, we don't have a word for that. Um, and because it becomes important to us, and it's not only a concept, but it's a whole discussion point and whatever, I think we need to be uh, aware and practice the justice, truth and mercy of which you speak, definitely, and try to make it a part of our life. And I think there'll be a natural reaching out between um, the Native Americans and ourselves or whatever group we're talking about. What is the missing link of the dominant culture with regards to who they are that compels them to embrace cultural genocide as their mode of motivation to connecting with diverse culture? I'm not sure what you're asking me there, Kim. Um, what is the missing link of the dominant culture? That's us, I guess, with regards to who they are. That's, oh, I get it, I think. That's who the Native Americans are or whatever group that compels them to embrace cultural genocide as the mode of motivation for connecting with a diverse culture. Um, I think I've, I've I'll answer that in a couple of different ways because uh, immediately what pops into my head are different scenarios. We have the war scenario where uh, we have a dominant culture that just wants to wipe out the other culture because they believe they're right, they believe they have the truth, they believe they're pure, uh, and they believe they could have a whole better life if we just got rid of those people down the road there who are taking up this space and have no sense and whatever. And uh, I, I think that leads to uh, just a straight out genocide or the other way that that genocide is expressed by raping the women so that they will have uh, the dominant culture's children. You know, um, and then the other thing is um, it leads me to think of the book Lord of the Flies, and I don't know if you've read of it. If we don't have laws and regulations which are lived out with justice and mercy and respect and love and compassion, then some of the baser sides of our nature, our desire, uh, to dominate, to propagate, to be successful, and all of these uh, things to a, a um, uh, inordinate uh, extent take over, and that's where we practice a genocide of some form or another. Now, when I say that, uh, we need competition, um, but everything needs to be in moderation. Uh, 
we can't have the drive side of our life, if you like, overwhelm the nurture side of our life. They need to be in dialogue with each other so that we're not all drive, get ahead, uh, success at any cost, greed gets us. We need um, nurture, the care, the concern, the compassion. So we've got to dialogue within ourselves about these warring parts within ourselves and get them in balance. And in fact, I would argue that in our particular society at this particular time, we need more of the, the compassion and whatever to dominate. So uh, if that in some ways provides some little framework as to why uh, we find it difficult, because I don't think we take enough time to sit back and truly reflect. Uh, David asks, is it more than being right? If we look throughout history, ancient Egypt, Germany, da 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 da, is it also the dominant culture looks at other people uh, not as people but commodities? And David, you're correct. If you go back, and, and religions have played into this, um, if you go back into some of the um, religious teachings on uh, people of Africa, um, they didn't have to baptize them because they didn't have a soul, because they weren't fully human. So that element there certainly is in our uh, history that we looked at many people who were not these trading um, uh, navigational types, in other words, weren't European and white, were less than. And that's how we treated them. And you're right, it is, and thanks for bringing that up, that it is not just um, it is not just uh, being right, but it is also a sense of uh, we're the smarter. We got we we travel to your place. We've got the guns. We can overcome you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It all plays into that, and you therefore are not as good uh, as we are. Okay. Um, do 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 do. Shelley Steele, would I be up there? You're after oh, uh, Kim. Uh, uh, they were getting more questions here. I'm up, uh, David, Kim. History depicts, depicts the patterns and practices of the dominant culture by co covert and overt mechanisms of political privileges have proven to be an abomination to diverse cultures. You know, uh, uh, my hesitation in, in totally agreeing with that is and let me take the Catholic Church uh, in Latin America. You have, uh, and let's take uh, clergy. You have uh, with, just for me to show that the generalization, always beware of generalizations. Let's say you've got uh, the uh, Catholic Church going in to convert um, certain parts of South America. You have both part of the Catholic Church identifying with the um, dominant, uh, with the rich and the privileged, and then you had part of the uh, church um, identifying with the poor. And the establishment then of many of those uh, liberation theologies and these movements uh, within the country, one group being supported by one half of the dominant culture and the other uh, group, uh, the poor and, whom, uh, and the downtrodden being supported by the other part of the uh, dominant culture. So what I'm really saying there is it, it's, we only ever see history when we read history books from the point of view of the person who wrote the history book. So you've got to look at history and look at it from many points of view and from many historical perspectives. So part of what you're saying is true, but there's also a counter side to it, Kim, I think, anyway. And I'm probably now getting a little quicker on answering the question, so um, I um, apologize. Uh, but I get also conscious of time. Now I have Marie. 
I, uh, Dr. Hale, I believe that you have summarized a very important weakness in teaching strategies in general. Regardless of the group, Native American, Aborigine, Maroons, or students diagnosed with disabilities, the successful collaboration teacher facilitator will have approached their interactions with an historical understanding and attempt to find the commonalities, the positive contributions, etc., from these groups. Educators or organization leaders need to understand these principles in dealing with others. Do you think that Native Americans, in your experience, were able to help convert the teachers to understand their stories? It seems that critical thinking educators would catch on to uh, the reality that the communication was two ways. You know what? Uh, you really only have a, I agree with what you say at the beginning, and I'd have to say I'm very sorry to say my experience has been that a lot, some do catch on and some don't. I've heard the saying, there's none so blind as those who will not see. If you go in with the mental attitude, which I've seen our, some of our um, people do at, uh, our people, some of the people do at Eagle Butte, they really believed that they were bringing the goods to the Native Americans. Much the same way as I think uh, many missionaries believe they were bringing salvation to whatever group they were taking it to. So they were the do-gooders. I do believe that there is a slow reversal in understanding, no, this is a mutuality here. Some people still see that they, that they really do have the goods and can't understand why um, you know, the people are just not receiving it. And I'm, I believe if Julie had been with you here today, she would have said to you one of the greatest frustrations that she experiences as a Native American woman interacting with other educators, how they don't get it. They don't get it. So I have to say um, you, you would hope that critical thinking educators would get it, but they don't. And I don't know whether it's fear, blindness, or what, or it's just that they really don't think. They're so immersed in believing they're correct that they don't think. And so I would hope that it would be the way you state my experience tells me no, it isn't. D, we have another question. We often find it easy to, to dismiss those who do not communicate the same way that we do. Tend to label them and prescribe a solution without really listening. Yes. Is there a measure we could utilize in order to make sure we are really listening? The only measure that I've ever found, and it's not a very good measure, I don't think is, if somebody, and see, I was running the place, so very often people were coming to me to present something. Or I would go to them, I would go to their office, whatever. But at the end of the conversation to say, this is what I think I'm hearing. I will summarize it for you and try to see if I really got it. And um, that provides an opportunity for the other person to say, no, you haven't got it. Uh, or yes, you do have it. Now, I'm only giving you something that works in, in a one-on-one -on -one situation. So um, that's all I can offer there. Uh, Shelley, I don't know if Martha, I guess Martha can see um, your answer there, so I won't... Uh, comment on that one. Uh, and Dr. Butel, two ideas at least I'm taking from your presentation is the correlation between the 3D dimension and dynamic perceptions and understanding needed for social situations. And yes, I am saying that. Well, I think that anyway. Um, and Kim is typing, and I'm just going to move this down a little so I can see more of what uh, Dr. Butel is saying, um, need for social, and the link to the art of leadership. 
Dr. Mitra opened to us. Secondly, the institutions could also benefit from understanding the richness of culture's approach to the world in which they live, e.g. Western-based nursing programs. I thoroughly agree with that and let's try uh, social work programs understanding the whole family approach um, to that Native Americans have. And um, I used to have this discussion a lot with our social uh, work faculty about how the books are very often written by social workers who are coming out of particular situations and very often they're in a city situations which just don't apply too much on the, um, uh, on the reservation. Dr. Mitra, I recently heard a director from the Metropolitan Museum describe all art as uh, falling into two categories, the art that describes, evaluates, upholds, love and art that does the opposite, that, it, that, is, that is upholds hatred. Can the trajectory of social justice practices be reduced to these very simplistic but somewhat useful category? Um, the only question I would have there, Dr. Mitra, is social justice uh, by its terminology and um, um, Wait there, I'm just going, uh, by its definition, should uh, not uphold hatred. Now, if it does, I would question whether it's justice. Um, I, I, I would, um, but then again, it's going, see, if you look at justice as pro promoting harmony and peace, I don't think it upholds the hatred point. I get what you're getting at. And I do believe if I think I'm doing social justice to a group, then I would be up, could well be upholding hatred. But I don't think you do social justice to a group. I, I think it's, um, you've got to bring in the mutuality, the harmony, the collaboration, the evaluation. I think it's a whole lot uh, harder than that, but it's an interesting point to raise. Or should I correctly say the newly freed slaves who were continuously looked upon as runaway slaves cohabited with the Indians? And you know, um, that that I, I would be inclined to think that the um, women from the African American tribes had a great nurturing tradition uh, in, a, in a similar way as the Native American women. I don't think it's necessarily something, because I believe women generally, part of the, the nature um, of their role in society is to be a nurturer. And I do think, and I'll put this in another context, which I was going to deal with in the talk, but I noticed I, tended to get away um, get away with myself and talking a lot more about other situations and that is alcohol and drugs tend to be an issue on the reservation and from and this is from my observation and conversations it's not so much an issue among the women because the fundamental role of women has not changed in the, in the same way that the fundamental role of the men has changed. And that is, the women are still the mothers and the nurturers. And they played a subsidiary role in the uh, earlier uh, iterations of the Native American society of doing some gathering and clothes making and this sort of thing. The men were out making the laws, uh, but more importantly, hunting. And they had a, a, a very real role, but with the disintegration of their roles and their society, they became somewhat a displaced person or persons. And when life oh, is no. overwhelming, oh, am I being told to stop? No, I'm sorry, Lauren. Somebody cleared the chat. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, um, the uh, w when they lost this role, they became a displaced person, and then that becomes 
overwhelming and uh, not overwhelming, they're afloat. And one of the things that makes life more palatable when you don't have a strong sense of who am I as person, what is my role in the world, here are my beliefs, here is what I'm achieving, here is what I'm doing, and I'm needed, important, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it's easy to drop into the alcohol and drug uh, uh, situation. And I believe this is why drugs uh, get to be uh, such a, um, uh, uh, and alcohol gets to be such a problem on the reservation. And it's easy just to, you know, just get out of life by drinking. And that's why I think it's reprehensible that uh, in the name of money, uh, we would go and build um, liquor stores almost on the um, on the um, reservation doorstep, and um, so that was that's how I um, uh, how I um, uh, respond to that and my understanding of uh, why they get to be those sorts of issues. Got another question here from Terry Young, Dr. Hale. You described that initially you felt that you were take uh, were taking something to the people with whom you were working rather than working with them mutually. Point out that that was not a good approach, and that it's important to work with people, including their view, rather than imposing that view. What caused you to notice, see, recognise the limitations of your initial view? In other words, what happened to you personally that caused you to change your view? Um, Terry, uh, uh, one of the things that I do, and this is part of my uh, socialization into being a member of a religious community, is that in the morning and in the evening, I have a review time on how I have acted during the day and what has gone on during the day and what did I learn, what didn't I learn, et cetera, et cetera. So that coupled with experiences and sitting in uh, meetings and being hauled up. I was hauled up to tribal council once on being, um, it wasn't me personally, that the college was a racist and that was an interesting experience. Uh, so they're a combination of uh, reading, interactions with persons, um, interactions with the group on the, um, on the uh, reservation, and the fact that I spend time processing those interactions and being very aware sometimes that they were way ahead of my thinking in this area. And so I had to adapt. Uh, I had to move on. And so my approach always is, each day I hope would be a growth and development day for me. So it's it's more uh, an approach that I have to life. I think that is what happened to me personally to help uh, change my view, develop my view, improve my view, and it's still a limited view. Uh, Addy, uh, what was your question that was um, erased? I don't know who did the erasing and um, so, and I don't know what your question was. I was only on the question that I was on. So if you would like uh, to um, write it to me again, I'll be more than happy. Ira, were learning styles a factor with Native American students? And if so, what teaching methods were used to educate Native Americans? You know, somewhere along the line, I remember doing some study on um, learning styles with Native Americans. and. Um, my uh, recollections of that is is that they're not as much into uh, the abstract as we are, and I'm not there. Uh, I'm not suggesting they don't think abstractly, but if you think about what their tradition has been in um, initiating the uh, young men to becoming braves and warriors, and the young women into becoming the uh, mothers and nurturers and the um, uh, uh, wise women, 
um, it has been of a far more practical style, i.e. Um, the practical style of um, the doing and rather than you know putting it in a book and learning it from a book and then translating it into practice theirs was uh, let's do it and uh, where we talk about the hands-on learning the experiential learning um, that sort of approach has been their general approach and um, I, I believe that still is helpful and let's be uh, mindful of the fact that in a regular classroom we have those who are visual learners and those who are auditory learners, or those who are experiential learners or if we go with Gardner, all those, um, you know, the multiple intelligences approach. So I would, my memory is that for Native Americans it has been predominantly um, experiential. Uh, Kim, there is a critical need to implement culturally responsive pedagogy into instructional frameworks of higher education. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think the people who will best do that is like my colleague, um, um, uh, Julie Thorstenson, who is a Native American and she worked with the university and set up um, her dissertation. And I do think, um, and it was most interesting dissertation, she did it between uh, the cultures of um, a religiously based institution, a state based institution and a an institution in um, South America and uh, values of engineering students, I think it was. So um, I do think uh, there's a great opportunity for bringing um, uh, um, different cultural approaches in um, to higher ed. Um, so thank you for that, Ira and Kim. There's a critical need to implement culture. No, that was Kim. I'm sorry, Addie. I was discussing the prevalence of African indigenous culture in the Caribbean, South America, and hidden within African American culture and the values hidden, oh, hidden within me. Yeah, yes. Um, you know, I talked a bit about, I think I'm getting a question there, Addie. I'm talking a bit about how um, the French and the Spanish, when they went into different cultures, uh, tended to inter intermarry and create a Creole culture. And uh, so you have whole different situations on the Caribbean islands than you do in um, America, for example, because the um, African-Americans who were brought into America were interacting with those mainly of an English European background, and not, uh, not the French and Spanish. They were the Creoles in the um, uh, south of the country. But a lot of the times, the north and south, the landowners were from out of the English tradition and they kept themselves aloof and above. Ira, again, they were, uh, they were more like kinesthetic learners. Yes, Ira. Mm -hmm. Kim, uh, Empress Addie, what? No, I, 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 I can't comment on that one. Um, the questions then seem to have come somewhat um, to an end. Um, I realise uh, that you uh, have been a very patient audience and I do apologise. I noticed that uh, my line speed is not as quick as some others and I'm sorry that's the limitation of my internet and I apologise for that because that would make it fairly difficult. I hope the sound was okay for you all and I thank you all very much um, for um, your time. With me. Dr. Hale, I think you have uh, more attendees typing. Uh, Dr. Carraway. Okay. Typing. I, yeah, I see, um, see. Is it possible that Native Americans were practicing a better form of art, uh, uh, sustainability? Oh, yeah, definitely. I totally <laughs> that the Native Americans and the um, Aborigines are forming a better degree of sustainability than we are. And really, I should defer to uh, 
Dr. Butel there, who is uh, doing so much sustainability. Would you agree with that, Dr. Butel? Um, definitely. And and the different American um, tribes had different approaches to how they lived. The Ojibwe were the, called the Piney Forest people, and they lived within the forest, and the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, uh, Maidan, uh, Sioux peoples were more uh, settled in communities, and they taught us a lot. In fact, Minnesotans took from um, the native Dakotas the um, art of putting a fish in their ground to help fertilize the um, the crops. So um, Minnesotans decided to make that into an industry, of course, and then overdid things. And uh, as we we're overdoing things, a lot of things. But the native peoples really had to live within their cultures, not always successfully as climate changed, but yes. um, very successfully. Yeah, thank you. So yes, I think we there is, um, and I, I think probably more than their practices now, what we would probably do very well is to learn of their values and their approach. Um, how they relate to Mother Earth and the Great Spirit. And, and it's it, it's not all chopped up. Um, our our um, history has so much Greek in it and, um, you know, the separation of body and soul and mind and body and whatever, whatever. But when you hear the, uh, the Native American talking about the cottonwood tree making its prayer to the Great Spirit and, you know, Mother Earth, they, they live that. For us, it's a development um, in our thinking, the earth was there to sustain us. On the seventh day, God created, uh, now God rested, but God created the whole earth and then he created us and we were sent out to control the earth. That is not their myth story of creation. It, it does not come that way. And our myth story is written out of our um, cultural experience and understanding. Their story of creation is written out of their uh, culture and understanding, and it's much softer and gentler uh, to the earth than ours. And it, it, it's that's you know we can't go back to um, uh, planting seed by hand uh, or, or or any of that. We can't do that, but we can take the fundamental value of love of the earth, true love, true love of the earth. Um, oh, uh, Dr. Car uh, a lot of people have said thank you. Um, um, go to Jim Carraway's because uh, it's, a, it's an ethics question, if you can get down there. Okay, I see yeah. Dr. Carraway's. Several feminist ethicists speak of the ethics of care and distinguish between care and justice. They see justice as a masculine objective, external, while feminists uh, engage in care, which is personal, relational, and non-objective. What is your assessment of the distinction between care and justice? Uh, Dr. Kaway, I take the first thing up. I think that's a very interesting distinction. I myself do not like too many distinctions, as I think I just alluded there. I don't like this man, woman, and I'm not trying to say we're the same at, at all but I would go back to Helen Baker Miller, a psychologist who talks about in our society, we, we've kind of uh, polarized or dichotomized the man and the woman. I think a man can, uh, should, could, does, is, nurturer. I think a woman can be, uh, uh, needs to step back sometimes and be thoughtful, analytical, um, um, assertive and what we term as, as um, masculine characteristics. And where I think we need to go is down a blending of the two. Um, let's look at justice from uh, that particular point of view and then let, let's look at care, but let's bring them together for caring justice or a justice of care, a care of justice. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't like the dichotomies, though, is what I'm really saying to you, because I think we lose something in them. However, I do think they're great for thinking. 
and then let's synthesize for action. And that would be my response there. Um, so um, the other, I don't think anyone else, Terry. No, I think you have a lot of thank you there. Lots of thank yous there. Um, I want you to take a breath. If you've got some water next to you, you should get a drink of water. Um, I would like to share with everyone that um, this presentation has been recorded. And I would strongly recommend, especially um, those of you doing uh, portfolios where you have to analyze what you put in in an earlier portfolio and see what you've gotten from a later presentation or seminar, how you then add to it and think differently. And I think that's um, a rather extraordinary presentation so that you absolutely uh, get to uh, add a, a, a different view, maybe a more consolidating view. But um, I can only say thank you. I think it shows me in a note that Dr. Butel raised her hand, but I don't see it on the list. Oh, no, um, no. I was I'm, trying to get the applause going here. Oh, okay. That's what was going on. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, just so you know, because my chat box got... Um, huge for some reason in the last 15 minutes. Um, Addie, no one was being disrespectful. I took away the chat. I cleared the chat because I was trying to clear it off my screen. So um, before we jump to conclusions again, we have to think very carefully before we put something in writing. Uh, it was my bad, actually, since only Drs. Hale, Bell, uh, uh, and myself had access to it. Um, thank you, whoever lowered it now, but <laughs> 15 minutes ago, Lorraine, you got like just your head, which I really appreciate everything. I think that, you know, you all got quite a high level of conversation here. It's extremely, extremely important that we hear this. I see Anu is clapping. Um, we're very, <laughs> very thrilled. I want to thank you very much, very much, Dr. Allen. That's why I know everyone is really enjoying the Leadership and Change Seminar and how lucky we are that you, have, that you are part of us. Let me take one moment, please, because you're certainly all welcome to send all the emails and thank yous that you want. Again, this was recorded. You can think more carefully about it, reflect upon it, and uh, review it at your own time. I will say that we do have a lunch scheduled, and I just want to very quickly go over that you need to go into the room for the class that you have at 3.30 for cohort 10. I believe that is, um, well, do you all know where you're supposed to be going? Uh, educational research for cohort 10, which is 783 for cohort 9. You've got legal issues, 702-703. For cohort eight, you will have INTP 790 internship. For cohort seven, you will have um, internship 791, I believe, as Dr. Mitra did 850 earlier this morning. For cohort six, 704 and 705 current issues. And um, 901 for dissertation research is the time allotted for cohort five. I am very happy that Dr. Hale does not have to do leadership and change for the next three hours. So I want to thank everybody and tell you to have a very nice lunch. And um, I cannot thank you enough, Lorraine. You never have disappointed me. And once again, you are the consummate scholar as well as practitioner. Thank you, everybody. Bravo, bravo. Bye-bye. 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 Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank mm -hmm.